the River Ruhr. At first glance, it seems idyllic. But nowhere else in Europe has man sacrificed nature for his own interests as profoundly as he has here. For centuries, animals barely survived here. However, the decline of heavy industry marked the beginning of a brand new chapter in the life of the Ruhr Valley. A place where plants and animals are now reclaiming what seemed to be lost forever. Today, the industry of the Ruhr Valley blazes with a different light. Instead of molten steel, the former steel mill of duisburg meiderich is now illuminated by light installations. There are no other signs of life. But that doesn't mean there is no life. The iron forest stirs. Why are desolate wastelands irresistible to some animals? What are they looking for amongst the scrap metal and steel monsters? The Ruhr Valley is the largest urban agglomeration in Germany. Five million people live in 15 cities. Metropolis borders metropolis. For a long time, it seemed there was no space for wildlife. Even today, Smokestacks still darken the sky, but their numbers are falling. Miraculously, the decommissioned chimneys now attract a bird that was almost extinct in Europe only a few decades ago, the peregrine falcon. For the peregrine, the higher the better, whether natural cliff or man-made building. Its chicks are only three weeks old and have already developed a hearty appetite. Safe and sound in their nesting box, they are free to eat in peace. The Ruhr Valley is ideally suited for the comeback of this charismatic bird. No other man-made landscape offers quite so many sky-high breeding sites. Peregrine falcons specialize in hunting medium-sized birds. is now a common bird in the region and the perfect size. Usually it nests in trees, but it also uses the nooks and ledges of buildings. The falcon needs space to catch its prey, so the pigeon's best option is to stay close to the man-made structures. The River Ruhr flows 120 kilometers down the valley and lends its name to the whole region. 
Despite once being Europe's biggest industrial area, a few green areas have survived. The remains of the riverbank forest suggest how it might have looked 300 million years ago. Vast rainforests growing in a tropical climate. Decaying trees then sank into the mud and were transformed over millions of years into what humans most desired, coal. Coal has been mined here for centuries. At its height in 1956, 125 million tons were extracted in a single year. Coal enabled the production of iron and steel. Industrial complexes emerged, transforming the area beyond recognition. The decline began in the 1970s, when demand for the Ruhr's coal began to dwindle. And the number of industrial ruins began to rise. Since then, nature has been regaining ground, largely unimpeded. Sometimes it's in the smallest cracks, sometimes whole structures. Today, undemanding birch trees, forest pioneers, grow in bunkers once used for storing iron ores and coking coal. Foxes are famous for their ability to adapt to new habitats. The robin has spotted the vixen, but no one else seems to take any notice. Within the ruins, it can search for food in broad daylight without being targeted by human hunters. Countless cracks, holes and fissures provide ideal hideouts for mice and other small animals, the fox's preferred prey. Provided there are enough hedges and woods nearby, many a former forest dweller finds these abandoned steel mills with their various hiding places to be the perfect habitat. But where factories were only demolished a few years ago, everything lies abandoned. It will take years for bigger plants to take root in this compressed soil, and yet there is someone for whom this surface is just right, the little ringed plover. Perfectly adapted to life on gravel banks, this family is looking for spiders and insects. Quick as a flash, the birds move from place to place, essential for survival in open spaces. The young ones are on their feet from day one, mimicking their parents. In recent years, the birds have become increasingly rare, as their usual habitat shrinks. New breeding sites like this demolition area are a great help. Open spaces are vital to the little ringed plover's survival, ensuring that no one can approach unseen. Caring for one's plumage is part of growing up.
even though the young ones will soon fledge, they still seek their mother's warmth and shelter. A common kestrel. Has he spotted the family? The vigilant father warns the others. Bravely, the mother tries to draw attention to herself. She can fly away, her young cannot. Elsewhere, abandoned land has already become overgrown. Recapture by nature means constant change. Soon, even more plants will populate these wastelands. And there will be other new arrivals. Plant pioneers like the viper's bugloss have a hard time on the compressed and poisoned ground. But where they succeed in settling, they offer insects a taste of paradise. Once there are small animals, bigger animals soon follow. Where vegetation and abandoned equipment provide enough cover, one popular garden dweller finds shelter. The hedgehog has a hard time surviving in clean and tidy suburban plots with neatly trimmed lawns. But here, there are plenty of hideouts for this mother and its offspring. A family of hedgehogs in broad daylight is an unfamiliar sight, yet no one bothers them in these old industrial facilities. While this male is off looking for food on his own, his sibling still begs for milk as mothers nurse their young for six weeks. It's very insistent. It seems the mother thinks it's time to cut loose, but it gets what it wants in the end. There are plenty of treats to be found in the foliage. An earthworm would be the perfect dessert for the little one. But the brother has no intention of sharing. Meanwhile, the small family doesn't know they are being watched. But their sensitive noses are not so easily fooled. The vixen gives up. There are many interesting hideouts in amongst the rusty mining gear, some of them offering shelter. This is exactly what they are missing in many of the clean and tidy gardens. The best shelters come from a time when the Ruhr region was exploited to its fullest. Throughout the year, Hedgehogs use foliage to build comfortable nests. An ideal place to sleep.
the Zollverein Colliery. What used to be the largest coal mine in the world is now an industrial artefact. By the end of the 60s, output was still at 3 million tonnes per annum. The mine was abandoned for good in 1986, after 135 years of service. Today, many slag heaps are popular tourist attractions. To animals, they offer little but hard soil. Rainwater accumulates in large puddles, but it's nothing permanent. And yet, surprisingly, one can hear a concert during the mild spring nights in the seemingly dead junkyard. A couple of natterjack toads. Once he's found her, the male holds tight to his mate. Meadow wetlands, the original habitat of the natterjack toad, have largely been destroyed. As a result, they must relocate to artificial habitats. In the throes of passion, the male grabs her the wrong way. It takes a while for them to find the right position again. Today, the endangered toads can be found in very high numbers on the wastelands between Rhine and Ruhr. But why and how? Firstly, the tiny bodies of water exist so briefly that no predatory fish can settle. Secondly, the water doesn't drain immediately, giving the tadpoles the three weeks they need to develop into fully grown toads, the shortest period needed by any amphibian in a temperate zone. But the toad's Eden is temporary. Eventually, plants will invade the plateau, rising from the slopes. Of course, these huge heaps have come from underground. Mining often leads to cave-ins and groundwater fills these sinks, creating fens and lakes. Now, they form a patchwork of different wetlands, along with the remains of the Ruhr's old water meadow. A watery wilderness attracting many animals, including the grey heron. These stork-sized fishermen nest in large colonies in tall trees, preferably close to water. Those who don't find an empty nest from the year before must start building all over again, with both partners joining in the work. Once business is taken care of, it's time for pleasure. The heron population in the Ruhr Valley increased significantly after heron hunting ceased. The waterlogged forest reveals what the whole Ruhr Valley would look like if it weren't for more than 800 pumps that constantly drain away the groundwater. Hallerai Lake is one of the oldest examples of mining subsidence. The calls of black-headed gulls bring it to life. Beneath them, their nesting sites reveal an entire drowned forest. Compared to other colonies, this one seems small. But it is one of the most significant in densely populated Germany.
The chicks are able to swim from day one, though they rarely dare to leave the nest. For the little one, the nest is shelter. Despite a rotting cadaver washing up, the parents refuse to abandon the site. Adult gulls sometimes feed on carrion, but the chick is fed regurgitated fish instead. It's hard to believe that this oasis is just an unintended byproduct of mining. On the northern outskirts of the Ruhr Valley, traversed by roads and industry, large forests dominate the landscape. 200 years ago, this was all heathland. Incredibly, these woodlands also owe their existence to mining as the mine shafts had to be supported by wooden pillars. The demand for so-called pitwood was enormous. So pine trees were planted on a large scale. Today the woods are left to themselves providing enough space for red deer, the largest of forest inhabitants. The deer rut in autumn is an impressive spectacle of nature, taking place just a dozen miles away from the center of the Ruhr megalopolis. Roaring stags impress both rivals and does with their far-ranging calls. During the rut, the stags move from the thick forest out into the open, allowing us to see them in a way that is possible in only very few of Europe's industrial nations. As only the strongest male is allowed to mate, stags do challenge each other, but real fights only break out rarely. The dominant stag is constantly busy keeping his harem together. Who the females will mate with is still unclear. Over many decades, nature was seen as of little importance in the Ruhr Valley and widely destroyed. Yet people searched for a way of compensating for their loss. The gloomy working class neighborhoods have become neat suburbs now, but a 150 year old tradition is still cherished. Klaus Schmelzer is one of about 10,000 breeders of carrier pigeons in the Ruhr Valley. He used to work as a foreman in the coal mines and got his first pigeon loft when he was only 14 years old. His hobby helped him deal with the hard work demanded by his job. As the number of miners falls, so does the number of pigeons. Race days are the highlight of the year for pigeon fanciers. But to be successful, the birds have to train regularly. Under the watchful eye of their owner,
For about two decades now, the airways have been getting more dangerous. New arrivals are moving into the neighborhood. Occasionally, the odd pigeon fails to return. Peregrine falcons don't distinguish between wild pigeons and those beloved by breeders. Little surprise then that wildlife conservation is not welcomed by everyone. Pigeon fanciers in particular may struggle to admire these returning aerial hunters. In many places, today's Ruhr Valley appears quite green. The vestiges of industrialization, like this old foundry, are now just monuments to decay. Leftovers from a noisy and hectic age. But these images also bear witness to an era of economic prosperity with full employment in the Ruhr. Today, this hall provides space for industrial nature and a hiding place for a secretive hunter. Beech martens are amongst the first to take possession of abandoned buildings. As former rock dwellers, they have adapted well to living in man-made structures. Like the fox, martens find plenty of prey in the numerous crevices. The roof shelters them from the rain, for now. The hall provides their offspring with the ideal environment for exploration protected from airborne predators. Though it's not always easy. Even mother can't help. She has other things on her mind. There's an abundance of little rodents in these ruins, making them ideal spots for a mouse catcher. Despite the predators, the hall is a good place for mice too. Where else would they find so many hiding places? Fortunately for the mouse, the marten is soon distracted. Inside the walls live weird creatures that seem to consist entirely of legs. Giant harvest men. Their legs span 20 centimeters. Migrants from Africa, they first turned up in Germany in 2004. They are partial to abandoned buildings. Dry and free of frost, Often hundreds of them gather in one spot. When threatened, they shake their bodies to warn neighbors and confuse predators. For these arachnids, the many industrial ruins of the Ruhr Valley provide excellent new habitats. But these bizarre creatures 
aren't the only animal migrants here. Duisburg, the world's largest inland harbour. Animals that usually live much further south have settled down here. Common wall lizards now sunbathe along the riverbanks, using the nooks and crannies as hideouts. Somehow, Jewsborg Harbour now boasts one of the most northern populations of the species. As cold-blooded animals, these reptiles need to get their energy by the sun. Fortunately, the Rhine Valley has a warmer climate than other places on this latitude. How they got into the harbour is unknown. They may have been released or come by water from the south. A different immigrant surely came by ship. The Chinese mitten crab. Introduced to the North Sea at the beginning of the last century, it has now conquered the Ruhr and the Rhine, amongst other places. Only able to spawn in salt water, the adults migrate to the sea and cover an astounding 10 kilometers per day for months on end. After spawning, the adult crabs die and the young return to the rivers of the Ruhr Valley. Along the way, they must repeatedly return to the water to find their food. Freshwater plants, small fish and even mussels. The crabs break open the shell with their strong claws. But they also annoy the fishermen by cutting their nets. And no one has been able to stop them from spreading. Recently, the crabs have been exported back to China, where they are a rare delicacy. Not all wildlife can cope with the hustle and bustle of urban spaces. water meadows of the Ruhr are often called the green lungs of the industrial region, a retreat for many more sensitive species. However, it isn't as pristine as it first appears. This is not a European beaver. They disappeared before industrialization and have yet to return. Neither the exotic slider turtle nor the nutria are native to the region. Nevertheless, in the protected areas of the Ruhr's floodplains, they find shelter alongside many original inhabitants. This newly hatched dragonfly will soon be master of its territory. And even a rare grass snake has made the area its home. Large animals have been reintroduced by conservationists. 
Since the beginning of the 21st century, part of the rural water meadows have been grazed by a herd of semi-feral heck cattle. Reminders of a time when cattle herding was common in the Ruhr Valley. They helped to conserve the open spaces of the Ruhr's floodplains. features a fascinating mix of ancient and new natural landscapes. More than 150 artificial table mountains now rise above what was once flat country, reaching heights of up to 100 meters. Some slag heaps are still used and grow into bald mountains. Others are slowly being reclaimed by the forest. Incredibly, the bare poisoned wastelands still represent paradise to a number of specialists. The blue-winged grasshopper is one of them. Perfectly camouflaged on the rocks, it avoids any unnecessary movement, just like its close relative, the slender blue-winged grasshopper. When threatened, these wasteland pioneers reveal their true splendor. They are perfectly adapted to life on the ground, and feed on low-growing plants. They also shun chirping in favor of visual communication. Leg movements convey information without making a sound. Sometimes, though, they simply need to find each other in this rough terrain. So, when a male discovers a female, it signals with its blue wings. A match made in slag heap heaven. Only when they are sure they belong to the same species of blue wing do they finally mate? Natural barren landscapes have almost vanished in Central Europe and the grasshoppers depending on them are highly endangered. For them, it is only a temporary refuge. In the end, nature won't be stopped. One day, everything will be cloaked in green once more. This script is playing its part as a master gardener. It ensures the spread of tree fruits such as acorns and nuts by collecting them and burying them for the winter. But the eager collector doesn't dig all of them back up. The missed fruits sprout into new shoots, which will in turn grow into a forest over the next 30 to 40 years. It takes time for nature to heal itself, and in many places, heavy industries are still in operation.
some well-traveled visitors have made a virtue of necessity. The towers of the power plant do not bother the resting greater white-fronted geese. On the contrary, thermal discharge causes the highly coveted winter seed to remain mostly free of snow. And it's not far to the lower Rhine, where the geese can rest on its great marshy plains. The airways between the Rhine and Ruhr are bustling. Great industrial complexes are still growing and stacks are still smoking in many places of the Ruhr Valley. But the Emscher is an example of how a region can be improved by human intervention. The river had served as a sewer for decades and was Europe's biggest cesspool. For the past 25 years, a massive effort has been made to direct the wastewater, 70% of the river's volume, underground. Over 400 kilometers of piping is now due to carry the wastewater, channel it underground, and return it into the Emscher after it has been purified in a treatment plant. The goal, to restore the entire course of the Emscher River. Where it's already free of her concrete corset, it meanders through the landscape, clear and clean. The new habitat appears to be tailor-made for the banded demoiselle. These heat-loving insects need small streams that are not too densely vegetated and still receive ample sunshine. The green-coloured females are well camouflaged. The flashier males try to impress them with courtship dances that show off their full splendour. They use their coloured wings as signals and to drive off other males from their territory, which barely stretches a few square metres. If a female lands in it, then the male will lead her to where she will lay her eggs. The couple then form the usual mating wheel. Shortly afterwards, the female lays her eggs and the larvae hatch about nine weeks later. Maybe in a few years, this animal will also resurface in the Emscher, the Eurasian otter. It has already returned to a few spots on the Lippa, the river on the northern border of the Ruhr area. This big marten needs clean waters in which to hunt for fish. Although, it always comes ashore to eat. For 50 years, the Eurasian otter was extinct throughout North Rhine-Westphalia as it was unable to find clean water.
Should it permanently return to the Emscher and Ruhr, then this would be a great success for nature conservation and atonement for past sins. For decades, the air in the Ruhr Valley was polluted and the land exploited and abused. Inevitably, nature had to pay for such ruthless exploitation. However, with its incredible power of regeneration, it manages to thrive even on ruins. Peregrine falcon is clearly one of the beneficiaries of the structural changes that have occurred, even if it was with the help of man. The Ruhr region is now home to more of these elegant raptors than anywhere else in Germany. Smokestacks act as surrogate rocks. This year's brood was nurtured well by the breeding pair, one of 100 in the region. The young birds are now fully fledged. But their maiden flight is a leap into the unknown. They have no choice but to trust their wings. To encourage them, the parents refuse to feed the youngsters until they take to the skies. So, they do. No animal is a natural-born master of flight, not even the fastest flyer on the planet. The young falcons are unaware that it used to smell, smolder and rumble here. They don't need untouched wilderness. The only things that matter to them are whether they can hunt and whether they can find high enough places to nest. Today, many of the steel giants appear to be nothing but legacies from another era. But the Ruhr Valley is staged to an incredible transformation from a heavily polluted coal mining area to a home for specialists and adaptation experts. For those who know how to exploit it, the iron jungle has plenty to offer.